sort of heads up um, on when to start wrapping up? Um, do we? Yeah, I can. I can do that. Okay. Um, yeah. So I guess we should mention we were we've it sort of been preparing for this talk in a long scattered way. Um, we were supposed to give this talk last residency. And so we'd had some email exchanges before that point, but it, it extends even further back. Um, and so we were going to start with sort of recounting how we got to the topic um, of what remembers you. Um, do you, I, we, we had some emails way back just, um, and there were some questions. Do you want to, should I read from that? Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> I was also just thinking that the more we talk about this, and down, we met a, maybe a week ago, just though, to talk about this, mm -hmm. the more we've written about it together, the, 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 um, the more the talk itself, in my mind, begins to disintegrate. <laughs> I think that like in like a year ago or in January, it seemed to be more, oh, this is, we can outline this and we can do this as like a, a talk. Mm -hmm. But I, maybe this is what naturally happens when you just start having a conversation, like the, the talk dissipates and then the conversation just becomes like a part of friendship. And then, and then the talk feels some like more uncomfortable. I yeah, know. I think we've been having this conversation for like a long time, like kind yeah. of since we've, you know, been corresponding. Yeah. Um, and a lot, a lot of it does circle around certain shared themes in, in each of our works, um, having to do with post memory. Yeah. Um, and um, another word that's come up pilgrimage. And I guess I would cite your talk, Brandon, that you did for PNCA some years ago about post memory. And um, and making a, a pilgrimage poetics, like the idea of like mm. making pilgrimages to certain sites where things have happened historically, and mm. um, that's certainly something that I've encountered in your work, and that I have done in my work, even though I've not done it totally consciously, um, or with like a great amount of like research or or, or planning. Mm. Um, <laughs> But um, yeah, so there's from from December 19th, 2021, I think I wrote to you and I was um, asking about Ital Adnan and um, just things having to do with the anthology I'm editing. And um, you wrote back just, you know, just um, this these lines about, I asked, I guess, how writing was going. You said writing is going okay. Afraid. I've been trying to write a paragraph for many years now about a staircase in the desert, a staircase to nowhere or rather detached from its building. Until I figure out how to write it, I can't really move on. Does that ever happen to you? Um, do you want to talk about that or? Yeah, well, so the day before you wrote to me, um, yeah, you wrote about asking about a tell and then you just said, how is your writing going? And I just think um just preliminarily that's a question that we often ask each other but maybe we don't really answer it's kind of like a version of how are you you know but how, how's writing going and I think it's a it's a really easy question to read over or to dismiss as just like a a, a salutation sort of thing mm -hmm. um but every once in a while, it's nice to take that question seriously. How is writing going? How is it going? Like, what's happening? Um, how is it feeling? And so, in that moment, I was I was working on this paragraph that I'm. This was two. This was a year and a half ago. That mm -hmm. I'm still working on. <laughs> so my answer back in December 2021 would be the same. Um, so a couple of days later, can you hear that jackhammer? Sorry. Oh, um, a couple of days later, so yeah, I said, there's a staircase, does that ever happen to you? And the question, I guess, of, of does that ever happen to you is that you get stuck on a particular thing that you're trying to write and, and until you feel like you've um, 
figured it out or realized it, you can't really move on. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I said, does that ever happen to you? So a few days later, you wrote, "Um, your question is a good one. I think I am still stopped on a patch of road, very possibly, or in a hallway, not yet truly entering the room where my father is waiting. I'm still continually trying to write water too. Sometimes I feel like if I could write these things sufficiently, then maybe I would not have to write anymore. Hey, Mama, if you want a phone, call me. Hello? Sometimes a dream of a clearing up ahead. Mm-hmm. Um, and then our correspondence stopped uh, for a year. I don't think that was the end of that for, for an entire year. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so it turned out you were also in your writing, but also in your consciousness, kind of stuck in a place like an actual place yeah. that you were trying to figure out through writing. Um, yeah. And then, so you wrote that and then a year later you, you like continued that thought in an email um, on November 14th, 2022. Should mm-hmm. I read that too? Sure. Um, I remember, okay, so this is, this is a year later. I remember something about a staircase in a desert or something in a desert. You had asked if there were places or situations I was stopped at. And in response, I've been thinking that I'm still stopped on a patch of road. I can't remember if I wrote that back to you in actuality or not. So that's also funny because you didn't, you didn't know if that was a, like an actual memory or, or an email that you had written. So a year later, you're still stuck on that patch <laughs> of road. I'm still stuck on that staircase in the desert. Not Mm-hmm. Uh, many things have changed but in a way nothing has changed at least in terms of that relationship maybe it's evolved a little bit but um so yeah. this now coincides with us thinking about our talk for pnca mm-hmm. and it's kind of like oh this is actually something we, we we're already talking about what are we talking about yeah what are these questions we're asking each other how do we how do we like turn this into something we can share yeah and i guess it's still a question yeah, and, and to bring in the sort of, you know, the term, like we were talking about memory or what what do you remember, but you had turned the question around asking what remembers you. So like the idea that there are these memories or these places or these, you know, things in our consciousness or geographies in the world that are actually calling to us um, or, you know, re- what's remembering you. Um, and um, yeah, and then to add to that, we had also like pondered the word remember as in like if you really broke it apart and like, you know, put the dash in between re and member, um, sort of like, you know, the antithesis of dismemberment to like what are we actually trying to bring back together or piece back together. Um, I feel like this might be a good time to like sort of talk about those places because this is staircase isn't the only place that you've been stopped. Um, And then after that initial exchange, I actually did like start writing a passage that started with, I'm still stopped on a patch of road. Um, And the patch of road does relate to a certain incident in, um, it's a patch of road in Vietnam. And it is something that I've I've written about or tried to write about a little bit in in instrument. Um, And it's still something like the events or the circumstances that I'm still wrestling with um in my writing but um we could go into that a little more we could talk about yeah do you do you want to talk about that patch of road um sure. give yeah. us some context and then maybe leading into why why you've been writing about it why you feel compelled to write about it or why why it seems to be calling you or returning to you or remembering you yeah. i guess yeah um, yeah, and this is something that I've, I admittedly have been writing about for, I mean, it's in my We Are Meant to Be a Gentle People memoir too, where there is, I do, there's a photograph of this patch of road. And what happened was that in 1972, um, and this is one among many incidents of, that's happening during the war, but um, there were refugees that were fleeing from north to the south of Vietnam, you know, um, in, you know, just response to the communists advancing. And um, there was a stretch of road along Highway 1 between like two bridges where there were refugees fleeing on the road. And then 
um, the North Vietnamese like you know, soldiers were hiding in the hills above and they, you know, shelled them. And so a lot of people were killed on this patch of road. Um, and this was like, you know, April or, or May 1972 that this incident happened, you know, and then like so and a lot of citizens like, you know, women and children, not just soldiers were killed. Um, and then the area was closed off. So something like the bodies like sat on that road for a long period of time. Um, and I, the story, as I'm told it, my, my parents, you know, ran a newspaper at that time. And so one of the press members was one of the people that came back into that area. Um, and it was July 2nd, um, 1972. And like reported back, you know, the scene and called it the highway of horror, like that's sort of the name that the incident was given. Um, and then my mom, you know, came to that scene also, um, like, you know, in that time period and with my father, they were both and they the the, the newspaper like had a part in helping to organize bur burying the bodies and trying to identify them. And this is significant because, you know, of course, like in Vietnamese culture, it's significant, like for families to know, you know, where, where they're, you know, where the, their loved ones are buried. Um, and I guess it's an incident that stayed with me because it, um, that time of the newspaper's arrival on the scene is like exactly nine months before I was born. So I sort of have this notion of like, you know, the, these are the circumstances that I was like, you know, um, born into or conceived into. And, um, and so um, it's that intersection of the personal and the collective that, um, that I guess fascinates me. Um, it's also an incident that isn't um, in the official history records, because North Vietnamese, the communist government, you know, has their own version of history and the South Vietnamese, you know, who are, you know, were the country dissolved and are in that diaspora have their own version. And so, so for people of my mother's generation, that is an incident that's like talked about and they talk about, you know, but it's, they, you know, sort of talked about in, in this bitter, sad way because it's not remembered. Um, and then, of course, the American, you know, military history doesn't really, you know, like that's not part of the American narrative because it's something that was happening, you know, between North and South um, mainly. So that that's the the history of that event. Were you um, born in April 73? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. When, when, what was your first exposure to this event, to the highway of horror, to any of what you just said? You know, I don't remember exactly. Like, I think my mom's always sort of told me, like, I remember that story about, you know, her standing on a road and seeing, you know, dead bodies. Um, and like, I remember that, like, vaguely from childhood. And then, you know, so, so it's always sort of been at the back. Um, and then I've learned more about it. And there's been like, like there was a Vietnamese American scholar who wrote about that incident. Um, and she wrote about, her name was Van Nguyen Marshall. And she wrote an, an article about that incident um, and, and, you know, talked about the newspaper's involvement, like as sort of a, um, a look at, um, you know, South Vietnamese like citizenship like how you know there was there are these independent efforts of like the newspaper and like you know um and versus the the sort of narrative of the south vietnamese being just you know puppet you know not having their own autonomy you know being just u.s um puppets or something um so there so i've learned about it a little bit from things like that um and um yeah, and then in 2020, I wanted to go and try to approximate going back to that area. And there is a, a memorial, as I've mentioned, that is um, on the side of the highway. And I was, you know, trying to find that to visit that. Um, so, um, so yeah, so there's a lot of reasons why that 
incident haunts me. And, you know, a lot of it is sort of the erasure of it and mm -hmm. my own in access to it. Um, but, you know, my imagined connection to it, you know, through my, my parents. Um, Did you say in access? In, yeah, in access, like Your lack of access. In, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, so, so that is, you know, something I'm returning to. Um, do you want to talk about Demanju? Yeah, I mean, I have so many more questions for you, but maybe, yeah, um, maybe I'll just get to this briefly, just so that we have these two locations established. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because, you know, I'm obviously really interested in, in the fact that that came to you maybe gradually through your mother sharing, mm -hmm. however fragmented it might have been, the story of her memory of it, mm -hmm. of having been there in the summer of 1972, right? But yeah. also just thinking, you know, that you're compelled by the, the nine months before you were born, mm -hmm. that um, between July of 72 and April of 73, that you're connecting to that time of, of like those months before you were born as, as being significant to um, the possibility of why you keep returning to it. Because yeah. in, a way, in a way you began, you began at least in the consciousness of staring at this space and contemplating it. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the e the emails. Um, this is I wrote an email to you on December seventh, twenty twenty two, which was Pearl Harbor Day, um, mm -hmm. and so it w we were originally talking about this patch of road. I was talking about the staircase in the desert, but then I was in a meeting. I don't remember December seventh, twenty twenty two. I don't know what meeting I was in, but I said I wrote to you. Um, or do you want to read this? Sorry. The one that I was in a meeting. Yeah, I was in a meeting today. <laughs> yeah, I was in a meeting today. And instead of listening, I was taking notes on what it might mean to remember or be remembered. I was thinking about visiting Hiroshima when I was 10 and walking along the Motoyasu, one of the tributaries of the Ota, and seeing a young girl and boy standing with garlands of tsuru overflowing from their arms. I was thinking that to remember is to be re-embodied by the moment we are remembering, i.e. to be reunited with our body in that moment, however long ago it was, to be reunited with that particular arrested self. But then I was wondering, what does writing do on top of remembering? Does it enshrine that particular body, self, liberate it, or make it disappear even further into the moment that is being remembered? And how does repair fit into this? Is it related to pair as in two? Yes. Yeah, so, so the context for me is, and also I'm curious how old you might have been when your mother started telling you those stories. Gosh, I don't, I don't remember. I mean, I feel like it's like, like I have this memory of her telling me, you know, maybe I'm like 12 or something about, you know, because I knew she was like you know, the newspaper and she was a writer. And so I kind of knew these stories about like, she was a writer and she was like famous in Vietnam, you know, before 75. Mm. Um, and so that was sort of just like this, you know, backstory, like I kind of, you know, and I have this vague memory of her telling some story about that, you know, and the road and the, you know, the, you know, just, and the, and the mass graves, like, you know, that they had to bury, you know, like I have this vague memory of it, but I don't remember exactly. Like, I feel like tendrils of it. And, you know, it's more convoluted because I didn't grow up with my father. So um, I had, you know, grown up with the, the, the information that my father died in the war, you know, and someone had died in the war. Um, it was, you know, the, the husband that my mother briefly had while she was pregnant. <clears throat> um you know like kind of personal like you know TMI information but but these are like all facts of like my personal life like it's like it's not you know conventional um but I didn't learn about the fact that who my birth father was until I was like 13 or 14 mm. so I had like just been told you know my father died in the war and that's who people thought was my father um and then my mother told me no actually your father's still alive um so you know that's another like 
um, and I've written about it like it's a you know resurrection or a rewriting um, of the story that I grew up with. And, you know, to be like, you know, told like, no, actually your real father's alive and he was a writer and, you know, um, so that's like just another element of it um, that, um, that, yeah, maybe she was telling me these things gradually around mm -hmm. you know, the time of my adolescence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, you know, I don't know, um, thinking about yourself as a parent or myself as a parent, Mm -hmm. you begin to realize that storytelling is a way for us to figure out something that you know it's you sort yeah. of think that when you're a kid like a, you're receiving a story that is somewhat complete that our parent has resolved it in some way in their mind mm -hmm. now that I'm telling stories to my child I'm realizing I'm telling these stories in order to figure out my own relationship to this story that I'm telling right mm -hmm. um you're doing the same, like just that idea that you talked about, about revisiting or revisiting something. I mean, it's sort of like this, you know, as a parent or as our parents were doing, like we're, we're constantly revisiting and rewriting or retelling a story. Um, and that's something else that you were like, you know, this other question we had about like, why do we keep returning to these certain sites or these certain stories? Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, so my situation with this mm -hmm. and going to Hiroshima when I was 10, so it's a similar age where we're being presented with a certain kind of historical yeah. information, reality that involves mass death, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, a, a link is seems very obvious there, but I don't think, I don't know if we were thinking about that when we were corresponding, yeah. but like that's the thing, that's one of the things that connects these places, but it also involves my parents. So thinking about your mother, like in, in whatever way, telling you the story about this, about this experience that she had. Um, so when I was 10, my parents, we, we traveled to Japan for the first time, mm -hmm. for my first time. And we, um, one of the first places we went to was Hiroshima. And there was no, there was no preface. There was no like preparation for it. It was just, we're going to go to this city. We're going to go to the museum. We're going to ron wander around this park. And, um, yeah. and just, you know, we're tourists. And I remember my parents gave me a comic book called I Saw It, which was a first person um, account of by this man who, who was a young boy at the time. Yeah. And it's a it's a comic book, but it's it's very graphic. There's a lot of violence. There's a lot of blood. There's a lot of dismemberment. Um, but it's a comic book for children and they get instead of instead of preparing me yeah. for what I was going to experience or even giving me much historical background they gave me a comic book <clears throat> which I still have I, sh I should have wow. found it um, and so suddenly I'm being thrown into this environment with little understanding except for these really terrifying horrifying images Mm -hmm. and then now I'm there and I'm meant to connect those images to this landscape this beautiful city um you know a city which for the most part has moved on it, you know it's yeah. it's like pilgrims like myself and other people who go there and in a way are insisting that Hiroshima um confined to a certain historical narrative that it, it you know it is 80 years later it's not really like abiding by that narrative anymore um, so we go to the museum and the museum is filled with all of these um, unfathomable images and um, documents. And of course, I'm 10. So I already I already don't have a very fully developed consciousness or <laughs> understanding of anything. And so and my parents aren't really saying anything. They're just they're just letting me and my sister wander around. And yeah. in fact, in my memory, I don't even see them. It's almost like they're somewhere behind me, not, you know, maybe they were just like sitting somewhere eating. Um, and the moment that I, the moment that I keep returning to is, is not a graphic moment. Um, it's not a moment of horror, but it's mm -hmm. me and my sister encounter this brother and sister who are, look relatively the same ages as us sister's a little bit older um, and they're holding these garlands of suru these um, origami cranes 
Mm-hmm. And they're, they're near the statue of Sadako Sasaki, who was the young, one of the, this young girl who became famous. She got radiation sickness and she said, well, if I fold 1000 cranes, I will get better. And so people all over the city and then all over Japan started folding cranes to, you know, help this girl get better. Um, she eventually died, but then th- that, that gesture became like the symbol of peace, the peace movement. So you see paper origami cranes called Tsuru. Um, these brother and sister were holding these like massive garlands. They were just, it was like they were, it was spilling out of their bodies. They weren't selling them. I guess they were passing them out. But the only thing I really remember is just my sister and I standing face to face with them. And they had these, you know, like bouquets of, colorful explosion um coming out of their arms and so that was that was it that's yeah that's the most indelible thing from that day and so december 27th 2022 um i'm still thinking about it i'm sitting in a meeting and i'm still there's something about that moment that has returned to me i feel like it's returning to me just as much as i'm returning to it and I wrote about it in the grave on the wall. So I already have written through it in the same way that you've already written through the patch of road in instrument and in previous books. Yeah. But yet it's still there. Yeah. Now, I think it's really important that we resist the idea that writing is exorcism, that, that we reach the end of, of something through writing. Mm-hmm. But I am really curious about this idea that we do write through something and that it still becomes this thing that we feel like we need to write about. It's Mm -hmm. inexhaustible. And some of the questions we were asking each other, um, really simple. Why is it so important to write the memory? Why Mm -hmm. is it so difficult to write the memory? And why does the memory keep coming back? Yeah. Those are kind of the three questions that um, I've been thinking about in relation to both of these things for ourselves considering mm-hmm. the fact that not only have we written about it, but we've published our writing about these particular places. Um, and yet that has not like um, exercised that relationship from us. Yeah. Um, so now that we've provided that, do you have a sense of how to answer any of those questions for yourself? Like why, why this patch of road in particular Mm -hmm. Uh, does it have anything to do with like the way your mother told it to you does it have anything to do with the 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 bodies themselves like the mass death Mm -hmm. Uh, is that in some way related to the idea of remembering um yeah I think one like you know like easy sort of emotional answer is it has to do with my parents and it has to do with, you know, like what um, is still silent or silenced for them, you know, like some, this, this episode of history, not having been, you know, shared or known, widely known about. Um, and that I know that still bothers them or haunts them um, and people of their generation. Um, and I think I harbored, you know, or have harbored a sort of sense of debt. I mean, I, I feel like that word was in my mind for like from a young age, um, just a sense of debt or responsibility or something to history, to my family, to like, you know, um, and I, I think I have less, you know, like I don't, you know, like I think early on in my writing career, I was like thinking I had to write about these things. And I, I think that less now, or I, I think myself less capable of it in sort of a, mm. you know, sentimental way Absolutely. where you would write the memoir and, you know, do justice for your parents or something. Um, I, I, yeah, I don't think that sentimentally about it, but um, so that that's one. Um, and, and then I guess what, what I'm, when I was listening to you talk and you're describing, you know, that what the image that was staying with you and it being the paper cranes um, and how like that's also sort of a symbol of, um, it sounds like a symbol of 
of wanting to heal or you know like there is something in that in that um and that that like I I'm I'm just kind of contemplating like what that you know if it's something about um that desire that impetus whatever of of what the what the paper cranes you know what the gesture of that is is trying to do in the world um if that is part of like you know what's speaking to you um and and there's also i in 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 the in the grave in the wall um on page 94 and the section on demandry when you describe that that setting um there's also a line that um I guess in the like this we're talking about Sadako um you you say wait um just about like the idea that there's like um that that's a lot to place on a child and the child as a symbol of this is like you know using that um you know, and there's a, just this line for Sadako, the responsibility was and continues to be, there is no peace, a burden beyond all proportion. Um, and that is, I'm just thinking about that. And I'm thinking about later in the chapter when you talk about, you you say everything had become a paper crane. Um, I don't know. I wonder if you could talk about that too. And if that, if any of that resonates with you, like sort of like, you know, if, if there's something in the act of trying to repair, I don't, I'm trying to avoid using the word here because it seems like, you know, um, but I feel like, you know, we are rewriting things and we're revisiting memories and we're revisiting these like difficult histories. Um, and it's it's to remember them as in to remember that they happened, but is there also like a level of like trying to transform them into something else or um, or some alchemy in the process of writing them that we're trying to evoke in our consciousnesses that um, would help us to perceive the memories differently? I don't know, or the histories differently. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think part of my problem is I don't have an answer to any of these questions, which is maybe why we're having this talk. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe writing itself is just a way to generate a question that you then you write. The reason why you write something over and over again is that you each time you're generating a new set of questions that you can then answer in the, in the next time you attempt to write that thing. Um, I mean, yeah, because I'm actually, it's funny, like, I, looking back at that chapter of, of The Grave on the Wall, everything I just said, I already wrote. Like, I thought, I always think, oh, this this memory is fresh. This th I just remember this thing for the first time. And then I look back and I've re and I've written that sentence exactly. Um, it's There's almost this, like, form of amnesia that I think happens in relation to s writing about a certain subject matter. Um, and maybe that amnesia becomes really significant in relation to being remembered by something. Um, it's like dragging us into a space of forgetting. Uh, there was something that that, that um, Kathy Carruth, who who's like a trauma um, theorist, I don't know. I don't. I don't know where the quote is or um, where to find it, but. Um, it's something about in order to remember something, you need to forget it first. That's a really like really shitty way of paraphrasing that, but um, uh, yeah, because I've been writing poems recently about about what I already wrote about in the grave on the wall about these brother and sister. But I but I think that I'm really curious now about the role of our parents. Mm -hmm. And it might not be like it might not be biological parents. It, it just might be somebody who transmitted not just a story, but their own inability to tell it. Because mm -hmm. you were saying that your parents um, they still feel haunted by this, and so not only are you receiving the story, but you're receiving their like 
their emotional relationship with the story. Mm-hmm. And that, that becomes something that also lives on in us and in our attempt to reenact it somehow. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> and I was also so thinking about the, the person who transmits that, but you know, when is a writer born? I often think about like, in what moment is a writer or in what moment is a poet born? And I think that, you know, so the monument on the patch of road in Vietnam and these garland of Suru next to the Moto Yasu where thousands of people tried to save themselves by jumping into this river, thinking that the water would heal them. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the water ended up killing them. Um, No, I mean, the United States killed them, but like the water, it didn't, it didn't save their bodies. The water, um, whatever it did to their bodies, the the water was filled um, from shore to shore with people stacked on top of each other. And so right next to that river is where I saw this brother and sister. But in these moments, and you have a picture of the monument and instrument, they're both really colorful. Hmm. They're these like tremendously mournful, despairing, Mm-hmm. nightmarish landscapes that bear this a tremendous weight but then we look we look off into a space of color and I think that you know for me that might be where the poet was born where mm-hmm. I'm turning where I'm in the place I'm trying to understand it I turn away and I look at something that's like quantifiably beautiful yeah. But yet that is somehow made to both heal and represent the thing that is impossible to look at. <clears throat> Which I think maybe that's like what most of my what most of my writing is doing. Uh I don't know. I'm just like thinking of that that because there's color in both of these moments for us. Well, I, I guess like, you know, I'm thinking one about the collective like sort of what you're saying about parents earlier or some like I'm thinking like there's you know is there a, a debt or a or belonging to the collective that we're responding to and sort of returning to these unresolvable moments um and then what you're describing about you know beauty um or color um you know <laughs> is this a survival mechanism um is this like uh a, a way to, um, you know, to keep going, to attempt to make sense of something that is really horrific. Um, and is that what the writer does? Is that what artists do? Um, but there's also that, you know, obviously, you know, that necessity of forgetting or the carelessness of forgetting, um, you know, is is that something I'm just throwing out questions <laughs> like is that something yeah. to be, like concerned about um but I I I feel that impulse toward like you know beauty is a simplistic way to say it but I think that <laughs> you know there there is you know I I don't have a desire I've I've spent a lot of time sort of you know looking at war photographs and just digging into this dark history and sometimes it's so dark um and there's so many atrocious things that were happening um, that um, it's hard to spend time in that space. And it's hard to, you know, as do I want as a writer to like, just, you know, here's this history that needs to be remembered and then you just end up recreating it. Um, and I think I have questions about that. Um, I, I want to hold that space and hold that regard you know, that, that awareness, but I don't necessarily want to just recreate, um, you know, like, I think we, we all understand, you know, like the power dynamics involved and, you know, geopolitical power dynamics. And um, I guess I have a question of like, you know, are we, is there an attempt to evolve it into something else when you're making art? Um, um, I've, spent a lot of years, you know, you know, at occasionally or just receiving feedback that what I make is sad or dark or depressing or, you know, the music that I make is sad. Um, and, um, but there's also always also like it, like, here's a question. Is there a, is there a pleasure 
for you as an artist in in the writing or in the returning to those places or those memories or in you know what what you make of them and is that part of you know what art is doing um I, I feel like in singing sad music there's also like something happening in the body that's like um it's not sad to me to to feel it um and it's you know it is like there is there's a process in that so I guess that might be another question to sort of add to you know the why of yeah I return to those places or those memories um or there's the flip question which we also talked about a little bit of like can you do too much can you can you dwell too much in trauma um yeah yeah I, well, when somebody says, oh, what you wrote or that music is really sad. I mean, f first of all, that seems like it says more about them, right, than about you and what you've Please done. Not. But yeah. do you do you ever respond to that? What do you say? Um, I don't know. Not directly. Like I've um, I mean, I, I spent like I've just I, I just. I, not not always no I haven't like you know I try to find places where it's I'm a little more welcome to be sad or you know quote you know like a, a pure sad but but I do I feel like um it is interesting um that response of like something you know makes somebody feel sad like I almost feel like it's like I like sad music or quote, like what people would call sad music. Um, and then I know other people who would listen to the same music and they're like, I just can't listen to it. You know, like they don't like the way it makes them feel and they need something else. Um, so I do think it is really mu very much about like what we each need or how comfortable we are with like, like I want to dwell, <laughs> like, I, like I feel comforted by, by so-called sad music. Um, so it's nourishing mm -hmm. in some way. Yeah. Um, and um and then you know I don't know like I you know is it it's it's yeah um I think it's a very individual thing um I yeah know. well yeah the question also of pleasure and mm -hmm. can we dwell too long in trauma I mean I think that I th especially in writing I think that um I think the general idea of what it means to dwell in trauma is like it's like a negative it's like a pejorative it's an it's a negative idea but dwelling in trauma is can be as diverse an experience as just being alive it's like there's moments of pleasure and moments of pain um right I mean it, when you hear that it's like oh why are you why you make so much sad why do you write so many about so many sad things why do you insist on dwelling in darkness? And it's like, well, to dwell means to ideally like breathe, breathe a very diverse life into a space, not just one emotion, but every emotion. Yeah. Um, and so I, maybe we've talked about this, maybe I've talked about this at PNCA too, but I have this collection of books on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Hiroshima library. Mm -hmm. And, um, when I first had this idea, it's just like a traveling library of books about the atomic bomb. And when I first had the idea, I knew that I want, wanted there to be ice cream served at the library. <clears throat> and when I went to Nagasaki for the first time, at ground zero, there was this old woman. I mean, I wrote about this in the grave on the wall. I'm just repeating everything I've already said uh there was a woman who was serving ice cream at, in ground zero and so people were walking around the the site and the monuments eating ice cream it was rose 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 water ice cream or rose ice cream and i thought that's well first of all it's the middle of the summer so it's very refreshing mm -hmm. but since then and maybe even prior to then because you know thinking back when i was 10 and there was something like really wonderful about these colors that these brother and sisters are holding um thinking about the refreshment in a place in, the, in a place of atrocity thinking about like the youthful innocence of eating ice cream in the midst of ground zero to me in a way makes perfect sense because that is 
Yeah. That is life. I mean, if you're attuned in a certain way, that is life. There is no, uh, especially as an American. I mean, as an American, it's pretty easy to, mm -hmm. to um, just like live in the ice cream. Um, but yeah, maybe as being like a diasporic, like it's it's about the ground zero and the ice cream. Yeah. Because it's all, and that's dwelling in trauma. I mean, eating ice cream at ground zero is dwelling in trauma. It's delicious. The woman is like really happy. She's making money. She's wheeling her cart around. People are like, this is really good ice cream. Yeah. I feel a little bit cooled in this moment. And now I'm going to continue looking at um, these representation of corpses that are like filling this riverbed. And what does that do? What is that? What does the ice cream do to the ex to the other experience? Um, they're not in, they're not unrelated. They're completely inseparable. But what does it do to have that pleasure or to inject that nourishment? You're saying you make you know you listen to music that comforts you, that nourishes you. What does that do then to the thing that is quote dark, mm -hmm. or sad or or traumatic? Yeah. Um, I mean, what you're describing, I think, is like it's, you know, the idea like we are we are dwelling in trauma. I mean, we are like as humans, like constantly dwelling in trauma. Um, so maybe the more unnatural thing is and it is a very American tendency is to want to avoid that or want to focus on the ice cream. Um, and, and 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 that is like, you know, I like I feel like that's that's harder to like accept in a way or like that's like you know this um but but this idea of it being you know a full spectrum um like it also acknowledges the trauma's existence I think um just as a part of us and you know um I don't know that's there's there's something in that um can I ask? So it's it's nine fifty. Um, where are you? Where are you now with all of this? Like this patch of road, um, you've written about it across multiple books. Maybe yeah. you even made music that like is re-entering that experience. Where are you now with this? Um, I'm still writing about it. I mean, I feel like. Um... Like I'm, there's still things about my mother and my father that I'm, you know, I guess wrestling with, um, and yeah, and I have some, I I did some interviews with my father, like I filmed him with the help of his friends, and he's speaking in Vietnamese, so I have to have these translated, um, and I did ask some questions about that road and about the newspaper and about his life. So I think I'm still holding space or, or, you know, that hallway, I'm still like trying to, you know, get a little more fully into the room or understand what I'm, what I'm sitting with or what I'm, you know, a part of. Um, and um, yeah, so in a way, I'm still continuing it. And, and there is a part of me that's a little averse to like the ways I've written about it, I feel like have been somewhat indirect um and they're more about like you know my consciousness or my like you know receipt of these fragments um rather than about the incidents themselves mm -hmm. um which seems like really big mm -hmm. um and so yeah i'm i'm still i'm still there um what about you i don't know i mean i think part of the part of the education, part of the pleasure in corresponding with you is, is I, I don't know if there's an answer to this. Like I'm still writing about this moment when I was 10. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know why, I don't know what I'm looking for. It's like, I'm trying to learn something from it. I know that I'm, that I'm older than I was the last time I wrote about it. And so I'm bringing all of that to it. Mm -hmm. um, and at a certain point, I think, yeah, the dwelling is really, really important to embrace that there is like a, there is a, a gift, I think, in these moments that return to us so that we return to, um, because it gives us a, it, you know, that image, that experience, it gives me a legitimate place to return to. 
I don't know what it does for me, but it's like the same thing as walking into a room and I don't know exactly, I go in there and I'm like, wait, why did I just come into this room? And then instead of questioning that, I just kind of sit down and I you know, spend time in that room. I think part of it too is in maybe a more, um, in a less like literary way or maybe even a less interesting way is that um, the, remem the remembering part is there was something that was there is that is important about me when I was 10 mm -hmm. there was something important about it's like I'm not only writing about the, th the thing I'm writing about the experience I'm writing about my 10 year old self that um was either like fractured prior to that encounter or was fractured because of that encounter mm -hmm. but that I I I really believe this that 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 version of me is still there. So it's like, I'm, I'm writing to revisit and spend time with that version of me. Mm -hmm. um, and that version of me is not complete. And it's like to write about and to spend time with that version of me is to, in a way, realize that version of me, um, whoever I was when I was 10, whatever I was going through, and then being thrown into a, a traumatized mm -hmm. space. Um, but there's many versions of me scattered throughout the past that I feel like writing is just a way for me to go spend time with like this litter of selves, um, you know, yeah. and then I think that it's almost like back, it's almost like back to the future where it's like, when I spend time with this litter of selves that can help my current self be bolstered and be reinforced in a way that Mm -hmm. unless I unless I return to the that litter of selves I begin to feel more disintegrated in the present it sounds like sense. a form of remembering I mean I don't know if we have a lot more time than this but when you when you recount the 10 year old self I'm also thinking about you know sort of um in psychology terms like what happens around nine or ten for the child um and then I homeschooled my son for a while and I did a lot of reading on Waldorf education. I actually wrote, read quite a bit of Rudolf Steiner. Um, and there is like, you know, this theory of what's happening around the age of nine or 10, and that like the sense of the child's sense of self is like separating. So it's like the birth of the ego and like the first realization of like separation of the, the self from the world. Um, and then like, you know, Waldorf education is sort of like, if you give them enough of a foundation before like, you know, nature and spiritual wonder and, um, you know, mythologies or something, they have sort of a, they develop like a, you know, unconscious sense of the, you know, whatever cosmogenic cycles like this, you know, sort of like mythologies are pretty, you know, tumultuous. There's like a lot of really, um, but that, that like what happens around nine or 10 is this separation, like this first realization of mortality or death. And I remember for myself that being a really terrifying time. And I like was obsessed with death and I had a lot of fears. And I think that relates to trauma, you know, like having just a, you know, an unstable, like earlier childhood and just a sense of, you know, disconnection. Um, and so I guess, you know, if a child is healthy or something like that, that transition, um, you know, maybe isn't as terrifying or something, or isn't, you know, like they find their way back to a sense of connection um, to, you know, nature, or, you know, if you want to think about a, a spiritual source or something. Um, but I'm thinking about that in terms of like, you know, what, what like, I wonder what your 10 year old self or what you, what you want to give to your 10 year old self or what your 10 year old self is like, maybe still asking for. Um, and if that is like a part of um there was also we we had some exchange about dreams and you were talking about a dream you had when you were a child and I guess I'm thinking about that too like nightmares um and um yeah if there is anything in that that resonates for you about you know just um 10 year 10 being a particular you know uh like important transition time for the consciousness um, yeah I didn't know that I mean you said that nine and not around nine or ten a child's sense of self is separating 
Yeah, there's there's like theories about it and like and they like Steiner has his thing about like the spirit and the body and like something about the time. I don't I can't remember exactly, but it is like this um you know, it's a it's a it coincides with like a a, a an awareness of like the eye um versus like, you know, I guess a sense of like being connected to everything or the nature and then like there's a sense of separation that happens. Um, and it's often like a time when like a child might have like their first awareness of death um, or where death like sort of impacts them. So it makes sense that if you had that experience around 10 and you're being, you know, like introduced to this really like enormous, you know, concept of death or just, you know, fact of death happening, like that that would impact your consciousness um, in a significant way. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and I think in psychology terms, there's probably, you know, something about the ego that is is developing around that age. Mm -hmm. what, when, so when you became obsessed with death around age 10, was this pro prior to hearing these stories from your mother? I don't, I don't remember exactly. I just remember like, it was almost like overnight, like, I don't know, I saw a scary movie and then I was just obsessed with the death and like mm -hmm. fearing, like I had a lot of fears, like, and it went on, you know, I don't know, for like a year or something. And I like, you know, made up this prayer every night that I would just like, and I would think about like all the ways that people could die, my family members, and thinking that like, if I, you know, put it in my prayer and I like asked for it not to happen, you know, that it wouldn't happen. Um, and yeah, I just remember it being a very acute, you know, like sense of like, I would walk outside and be afraid a tree would, would fall on me, you know, wow. just, yeah. um, and that being like around that age. Mm. Um, Did that also coincide with making things? Um, around then? I was always writing. I was always writing little stories yeah. when I was a child. It was my escape mechanism or just my place to go. I drew and I wrote. Um, so I don't remember. Yeah. But I, I feel like the birth of a writer is sort of like, you know, like in We Were Meant to Be a Gentle People, I sort of captioned that photograph of the road as place of conception. So I feel like it has a lot to do with my parents. If I had been born into a different situation or if we had not, you know, if there had not been an exodus because of a war, maybe I wouldn't be a writer. Um, so I feel like a lot of it was just kind of given to me in, in the fact that my parents were writers and that was the reason that they had their relationship, you know, because they shared this, you know, mission. Um, so, yeah, but those are things that I know it's not necessarily healthy or reasonable to assume, you know, as a person, like mm. I can have that in my mind, but it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, it was my destiny or it's like a reality mm -hmm. because my parents were writers, you know. I I just want to read one sentence from Instrument and then maybe we should we should end with that question we were we were thinking about about writing without writing. Um, by the way, I don't know, this is a plug, a plug for instrument for everybody who's sitting out there. This book is really incredible. Um, you shared it with me before it was published. I, I wrote a blurb for it, which um, it's impossible to summarize the experience of this book because there's so many things that are happening. There's so many, I mean, there's visual work, there's, um, there's, text that's in different colors there's poetry there's prose there's and in the way that things communicate across pages or through pages with each other this is a really simple sentence on page 141 um you say often i wish i did not have a body so i did not have to travel back to places i could not remember and i i mean that's the, the wish against something, I guess, is like, I don't know if that's negative or not, but um, that sentence seems to encapsulate a lot of the things that we're trying to figure out. Often I wish I did not have a body, so I did not have to travel back to places I could not remember. It's somewhat of a riddle, but it feels like it feels, ingesting that sentence, it, it really makes 
a lot of sense. Um, and maybe it's actually related to this question that we've been asking each other, um, mm -hmm. which is what? What is the question exactly? Um, we have? Well, um, how, how can we write without words? <laughs> yeah, and how did that come up? Um, oh, I think we're... I, yeah, I'm, I mean, I think we were talking about just I, I, like, I feel like we do all this writing also because like writing is sort of inadequate. I mean, maybe everything is inadequate to like hold, you know, what, what it is that the human being is grappling with. Um, and language is sort of the, the best vehicle we have as writers, but trying to articulate something that is maybe really inarticulable. Um, How can we write without writing? Yeah, or, or that what, it's, what's beyond the writing. <laughs> but, it, but that it's still writing. Yeah, or-, it's not, or just, it's not just thinking, right? Like writing without writing is not just thinking. It's still, how can you still write, but without writing? Yeah, or, you know, can you imagine, you know, is there a place in your- experience or you know your future where you don't have to write this memory anymore or you don't have to write about Hiroshima you know um yeah yeah I'm really like what what that. lies beyond um you know do you do you have a book of like you know that's just poems about flowers I don't know or just or not <laughs> not any not any do I have a book that's poems about flowers <laughs> Yeah, or just... I mean, why don't... Yeah, why don't I? I don't... Yeah, I don't... Well, you you wrote something in one of these emails about, like, I will I reach a point where I don't have to write mm -hmm. anymore? I don't know if it was a write about this anymore or write anymore. No. Um... I know that... I know that sometimes when I'm depressed, I really... I don't know if... I don't know if it's, like, um, it's kind of a chicken or egg thing, but it's, like... I really want to be able to just think my writing and not not write it down because I think one of the things that I really that really upsets me often is that when I'm inspired my automatic response is to translate that moment of inspiration into something as opposed to simply being inspired yeah and I Mm -hmm. I'm always I always feel like I'm betraying the moment of inspiration by writing it down I see I, I listen to a piece of music and that makes me want to write something down and it's almost like well what if I don't write it what if I'm simply inspired and why isn't that enough mm -hmm. and I think these I think that when I'm depressed, I go deeper into these questions and I'll stare out the window and I'll see like a deer wandering through the yard. And instead of making a note of it, it's just like, well, I just want to enjoy the vision. I want my ability to describe something to never leave my mind. But why do I then feel like if I'm, unless I'm writing it down, I'm not actually seeing anything. I'm not living, uh, you know, it's, it's really, it feels like a manic, uh, it feels like madness, you know. I would love to get to a place where I can write without writing, just by looking. Mm -hmm. or maybe, Do you ever feel that? Oh, yeah, yeah. I also, like, I feel like it might have something to do with, can you be in the present moment <laughs> purely without thinking about the past or, like, even the future past, like that, like, mm -hmm. urge to, like, you know, you're having a moment of inspiration and that urge to write it down is sort of something you're doing for your future self. Um, you know, so it's like, I, I don't know. I think it's a very philosophical question. Like I think of, you know, it's a good practitioner of like, you know, meditation and just mindfulness. I would be able to be in the moment without trying to get out of it <laughs> mm. or, or trying to capture it. Yeah, um, yeah. Because you would think that writing it down is a way to be even more fully in the moment as opposed to trying to get out of it. But often I feel like it it takes me away. Um, it gives me something to return to so that I can remember, I can remember myself. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. I often feel it's, it's I often feel like writing is a very um, particular kind of self-betrayal. Mm -hmm. 
um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure that out because it's the only thing that really, it's oddly one of the only things that actually makes me feel comfortable. So then why would I resist that? Why would I have this? Why would I feel that way? Well, um, there, there are some people in the world who don't need writing or, or maybe they have their own, you know, equivalent, but I, I feel like there are some people that are just better at, at, at not having that need to hold on or future reflection or wanting to help other people reflect. Um, and that might be a different kind of being in the body mm. um, and he, yeah I, I I feel like it's a quandary too um, mm. at, but at some point you know maybe I'm going to end up like you know staring out a window and saying less <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> we're probably probably at our time or but but yeah, maybe we can just end by asking that question in general, how can you write without writing? But also I really, um, these questions of, again, very simple, why is, it in, why is it so important that we write these moments, these memories, these experiences? Why is it so difficult? And really, and why do they keep coming back to us? Um, I guess questions that like everybody, everybody uh, who's here can, be thinking yeah. about in their in their own work yeah um, and, and maybe yeah. that also that idea of like <laughs> what is the you know that past self or what are you being remembered to mm -hmm. being revisited yeah um are we at time jay is that we <clears throat> um sadly we are at time um that was such an amazing conversation um brandon and dow thank you so much thank you thank you dow thank you brandon let's keep um, um let's keep talking about it brandon you right. made a um plug for dow's book i just wanted to also make a plug yeah. <laughs> for your new book hydra medusa that just was officially released into the world and yes. it's yay Yay, we, my Oculus workshop already had a, a great discussion about a little part of it. So thank you cool. all. Thank yeah, you so thank much. you. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you all. Thank you, Jay. Thanks. Thank you, Jay. Yeah. You're welcome. Sorry, we're not there. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>